very interesting set of papers, and I, I must admit that I was uh, completely uh, out of my, um, like my environment. Uh, I'm a medievalist, and so the sort of arguments presented here are very, very unfamiliar to me. Um, on many, many uh, respects, uh, the problem of the rise of capitalism is almost irrelevant in the medieval, for medievalists. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, as far as I, I thought it, it, it was, but, um, a, and it doesn't in influence, or it maybe we are trained to think that it shouldn't influence the way we think about uh, historical developments, long-term ones or short-term ones. Um, and in this uh, set of papers, uh, and Professor Arjuman's paper obviously um, presents one of these um, papers and arguments, uh, we have a, the question of the rise of capitalism. And for me, the, the most difficult part was to um, basically understand the chronology. Uh, and there are a s I was confused by chronologies because um, there was a reference to the 16th century and a certain rise of capitalism and capitalism as a kind of a 16th century phenomenon. And then uh, there is the reference to an 18th century sort of capitalism and a later capitalism. And so people usually call commercial capitalism or industrial capitalism, and these are different things. Um, and so I, I, the arguments come from the 16th century as a precedent to the industrialization uh, part. Um, from an economic point of view, I mean, the, most of the, I mean, as we have just seen, uh, the argument is that um, the reason the West rose was that the, there was a constraint on the rulers and that's, as far as I'm, I can tell, is not an economic argument. It's something referring to politics. And I, I think economists or economic historians have the right to actually look for economic answers uh, to economic processes uh, and economic development. So I was thinking, why, why not talk about, say, development of slavery in the Caribbean and the rates of return from that or something like the impact of silver or gold from the Americas and processes that are, you know, that explain the sort of rate of accumulation or something like, I have no idea what, uh, how you would put it, but these are mostly uh, economic uh, processes that could be understood. And so if we assume, uh, so basically I have a problem accepting the premises uh, uh, because of this business of, you know, the teleological, uh, you know, the training that I received as a historian, which is to try to avoid any kind of uh, teleological uh, kind of prediction uh, and since we know that capitalism developed. Uh, so the question is, uh, why didn't capitalism develop in the rest of the world? My, you know, it's m maybe an interesting question to a lot of people. Uh, the, the answer, I mean, uh, the, for me, what's, what's interesting is that you have all, um, capitalism set as the standard or European history as kind of the standard um, and then the rest of the world, basically, uh, as being deviant. Um, we could have the deviance being the norm, and then you see that it's very strange that the, the very small like number of societies are able to predate, I mean, through predatory and other forms of institutional development, such as, you know, slavery in the South in America. I mean, it's something very simple. I don't think it's kind of mystery or anything. But uh, so we have to now try to actually understand um, the, the lack of or the uh, failure of you know, the rest of the world to uh, develop institutional, uh, the, you know, the institutional um, kind of answers to um, developments that were not there to be had, that, or they couldn't in some respects because, say, they're Muslims. Um, and so my, I wasn't sure after reading Professor Arjuman's um, a paper whether uh, we are talking, I mean, whether it is, uh, for example, um, Islamic civilization uh, that is failing, or or just Safavid or Ottoman um, Ottoman empires that are, let's just say, they're failing to develop capitalism. Are there are there civilizational uh, processes that need to be brought to bear on these kinds of sort of questions? And if it's just talking about empires, and you know, let's talk then about empires, um, right? So. Um, and so I, what's the difference? What, what do we get from calling them Islamic, I mean, part of this Islamic civilization? I wasn't really uh, able to understand the difference as far as um, uh, kind of the explanatory power uh, that is brought to bear. Um, the 16th century, because I guess Weber and all kinds of 
arguments that are pre presupposed, 16th century you know, looms large, and so people look for 16th century in the Middle East uh, as kind of a period to kind of try to explain this business of failure. Uh, the, in, the, in Iran, in the context of Iran, yes, it's the Safavids, then, so we have to look at the Safavids in the Ottoman, uh, we have the Ottomans, then we have the Mughals. Um, okay, um, there are a few other states that also failed. Uh, my question is, um, Surely, where, by, when we kind of delineate these four spheres of uh, reality, social reality that Weber does, um, I'm just curious to know what these spheres may have been in the Middle East. Uh, if the 16th century sources or the 17th century sources have any sense of these, source, uh, of these spheres, if there is a self-conscious theoretical understanding of these things, and meaning what were they thinking they were doing? Uh, my understanding of the rise of capitalism is that the Europeans themselves didn't know they were developed in capitalism, and that it took 19th century social thinkers like everybody mentioned here, uh, from Moss to Weber to everybody, to actually tell them that they developed capitalism. Great, fantastic. Uh, but what did these people that uh, you know, we are studying, what did they really think they were doing? And it, you know, it's not, you know, in any case, what are these... Uh, these questions as they understood them. And if there are no spheres, of, if, if the sources, if their archival record doesn't show any of these spheres, um, how do we argue for the universal application, applicability of a, uh, uh, at least of a, of a theoretical development that is 19th century European one that developed you know, in parallel to colonialism and other forms of domination that are known and you know, from Foucault, everybody told us that you know all these things are associated with each other. Um, so I had a kind of well, I just finished grad school, so you have to understand. Um, <laughs> um, finally, uh, I'm, I'm just going to end because I well, two things. Let's you have in, in Professor Arjman's paper there is a reference to Iran, Iran and Safavid Iran, and you use them interchangeably. Uh, and I, I, I'm kind of guess that you don't try to actually show that there's some kind of nation state uh, emerging in the 16th century, uh, or, right? Or, or it's just, is the anachronism kind of part of, say, the, the theoretical framework, which is, you know, a sociological kind of nation state based uh, methodology? Uh, and then you mentioned this business of the, I guess, the, uh, the Mullahs forcing the the order, you know, this is just to end, and because you, you mentioned it in your, in your talk, the mullah is forcing uh, the non-Muslims to uh, not show up on the rainy day. And, I mean, the mullah forced the government to issue several orders forbidding the Jews and the Armenians from entering the streets and public spaces on rainy days. Then you add, uh, all this, needless to say, was economically harmful, even if it was not enforced, and, uh, and hampered the growth of domestic and international trade. Uh, so it it was harmful, but it wasn't enforced in rainy days. So I, I had a very hard time kind of, so if it rained a lot, and no, it, it, it's very difficult uh, because I know yesterday you actually said that you, this paper was not completed and so that made me feel so much better. <laughs> no, don't, that's, no, no, it's it, true. It would have been worse. No, it's, it's <laughs> but I had, I had very simple kind of basic doubts about the, the presuppositions, I guess. So, thanks. <laughs> okay.